the process of creating geodata is more than just going out and collecting the geodata. Matter of fact, that is only the last step of a series of things that you have to consider. So let's talk about how this process in general. I would typically say that it consists of three steps. Planning your work. That's probably the most important step. Creating a file structure to store the data. And once that's done, you can start adding your data. Of course, if you're using paper and pen, the creating the file structure might not be so um, necessary to start before starting the data collection. But it's still a good process to follow, even if you're using um, paper and pen for your data collection, because creating the file structure does often um, highlight issues in the way that you have designed your data collection. So stick to this approach that the first thing you do is that you plan your work. Once you've planned your work, you create a file structure for the data and then you start adding the data, even though you're going to use paper and pen for the data collection. And our situation is that you're not always um, I am so unlucky that you have to start on a blank sheet of paper sometimes there are some existing data that you want to modify. So in that situation, what you'll typically do is that you'll go to a larger data set, for instance, and then create a copy of that, perhaps a subset of it. And um, creating subsets is covered in the video on subsets. And then you can export that and work with that as your own data set. So in the situation of the university, we have lots of national data sets. And if you're going to do work somewhere, you would go find our national data set, create a subset for your sub area, save that subset set to your own profile somewhere in the network, and then work with that there. And of course you can change the attributes, you can do whatever modifications you want to do to that data set. So, these are the two situations are you have to start out on the plan or you can use existing data. The difference is that if you're starting out on the blank, we have these two steps of planning your work and creating the file structure, which is really important to address first. The planning of the work is um, really one of the most important steps that you have to consider. Um, whenever you're working with geodata, you should remember to think your work through before you start using the computer, because it is easier to, um, to focus on solving the problem while also having to focus on how the technology works. But especially when you're working with data collection, it is of utmost importance to consider what you're doing because it's often uh, very difficult and very expensive to undo, redo data collection because data collection means manpower in the field working and it takes a real long time to do. So you don't want to do it wrong. You want to do it right the first time. And there's also lots of situations where it will be impossible to redo it if you have made a mistake. If you have done interviews with people, well, the first interview would have affected their consciousness of the issue, and you therefore can't go out and redo it. So, whenever you're doing data collection, think carefully about what you're going to do, what type of data there is, and so on. Um, one way, well, there's different ways of, of looking at this data collection. Um, the primary issue that we are having to look at is identifying layers and thing, attributes. One way of doing it would be to create a sketch map um, and then to simply make a mock-up of your data set to see how it functions before starting the data collection. But before we do that, just a short reminder of some of the general issues of working with geodata. 
because the first issue that you will be you will be faced with when doing data collection that is how to store how to store variation um, if you remember this slide here from one of the previous videos we have our what we call our world of discourse that is the aspect of a area that we're interested in and that is then represented as a series of layers each of these layers has an attribute table and these attributes can play different roles if um, we look at the example of let's say um, streets well we could have a street network and that could just be represented as lines in a single feature class or layer if you wish in um, your GIS however there might be different types of roads there might be dirt tracks primary roads secondary roads motor roads should they be in the same layer should you have a motor road layer a dirt track layer a primary road layer and so on or should they be represented in the same layer with an attribute that distinguishes them um, and that's not really easy to answer it depends on how you conceive your data and also one of two technical things if we take the technical things first a feature class in ArcGIS can only consist of one type of geometry so you can only have our points lines or polygons in the same feature class so if what you're looking at land use saw urban furniture consist of more than one type of geometry well they have to be more than one layer present so you'll have a layer for the point data a layer for the linear data and a layer for the polygon data also if you're going to register different attributes about your different elements so you say that if it's a motor road you'll register how many lanes are on the motor road or does it have a hard shoulder or not you're not going to register the number of lanes on a uh, dirt track or on a secondary road so if you have attributes that you're only going to register on a specific type of roads then they have to be their own feature class because a feature class shares the same attributes all the elements in a feature class must have exactly the same attributes of course you don't have to fill them in um, and if you only got uh, one or two elements that you're not going to enter all the attributes on well then you might just leave them as blanks in your attribute table but it might be an indication that you should consider having them as different layers so deciding on whether to store your variation the differences as layers or attributes that is the issue in this case here this attribute table has an attribute called soil so we have different soil types here okay. um, and that could also we could have had a layer for each soil type if we wished or we could do as here where we can have a attribute that we use to divide into our sub sites or sub types so each of the different types of soil so we have basically what we call a subtype identifier so this one distinguishes between different types of soils and these are typically ones that when you make the map you will use the same attribute to distinguish between different types of soils so this is the approach that you will choose if you're going to have everything in one layer so you have all the roads in one layer then you will have a attribute called road type or just type and then that would specify motor road dirt track and so on so consider first do you want to have your data in different layers or do you have to have them or do you want to have them in a single layer 
once you have got that covered so you know which types of feature classes or layers you want to work with and what how which attributes you might want to consider you can start the next phase that is simply making a little mock-up of your map and the attribute tables so here I have a little simple map with a three buildings, a stream and a world network. And then I'll start out, say, okay, my stream network, yeah, I'll call them streams, they will be linear features. They will have an attribute called a name and how many cubic meters of water run through them an hour and a width given in whatever unit we're using. We can have our lakes. They can have an attribute describing the water quality, the density of fish, um, and the area in square meters. The road network has name, speed limit, and the width. And our buildings, they will have an address and the use and how many square meters the buildings are. So these are some of these different approaches we could pose. So if you make this markup and Note that I put in some example data. And that's typically the part of this mockup that you also put in some example data just to get see, okay, is this reasonable representation of my streams? So the only thing here we have we have our feature classes and we have its attributes, that's what we're going to use later. And then I'll put in some mockup data in each of my attribute. Um, tables that match my little mock-up map here. So creating a mock-up, but remember that it is only mock-up data, it's not the real data if you wish, um, it's the data that we use to investigate our data structure. Does it, can it be used for this? The next step we face with is that our attributes have to be declared. Um, in Excel you can just write things down in any column and if you write a text, it will be a text cell. If it's a, a number, it will be a number cell. Um, ArcGIS and most database applications are a bit more restrictive in that area. So you will have to, first of all, enter the types of data that you are working with. So you have to say, okay, this attribute name is going to be a text. This attribute water per hour is going to be a number and so on. In ArcGIS, the primary types are these. Um, they vary a bit. Uh, if you're using shape files, you, you won't really have all of these available. Um, but if you're going to use my recommendations, which is to use a file database, these are the types that you will find. You have integers, short and long. And uh, by the way, if you remember, I also cover these in the video about working with attribute tables. So hopefully you can remember some of it from that video. So we have integers, short and long. We have single position floating and double position floating. And you can see I've bolded out long and double. That's because for most situations, I wouldn't bother saving data and using a smaller the only thing is that it has a smaller range. So a short go, integer goes from plus minus 32,000, while a long goes from plus minus 247, 147 million. Um, yeah, that's, and um, the difference is that one takes up two bytes, and the other takes up four bytes. So each time you register a lake, you can save two bytes by using a short integer. And I don't believe that you will be creating so large data set that this is of any importance. So my typical advice is just create it large enough. Use long integers, use doubles. Texts, you have to enter a number of characters you need. So you just type in the number of characters you need. Remember, it has to be the longest name, longest text you can think of in that attribute has to be storable. So if you have a very long name, you'll have to have characters enough for storing that. We have dates. And if you're using a database, you also have access to storing rasters, they call it, basically images. So any photograph or like, 
And then we have Blobs, which is my absolute favorite because it's a nice name, Blob, which this means binary large object. And basically everything on the computer is a binary large object. Um, but what it's used for is something that ArcMap doesn't, or ArcGIS doesn't really care about. Videos, uh, sound recordings, any large data set that you can store, you can be stored in a blob, but ArcMap just doesn't really know so much about it. It leaves that to all applications. So these are the main data types that you should consider. So having looking at the same attributes tables from before, I have now said, okay, my addresses on my buildings are going to be a text that are 50 characters long. My use is a text that's 50 characters long. My square meters is a long integer. My um, square meters over here is a double because you can see I have used a decimal value here. So if you in your example mockup data, you have decimal values, you should of course use a double. I have here left out the types. So you can just sit down and consider mm, the name of the stream. Yeah, it should be a text. The volume, the water speed, cubic meters per hour. If you look, mm, there is a decimal here. So it should probably be a double, so a float, double float. And the width, mm, no decimals. So we could probably use an integer. Mm -hmm. These are over here. Uni University Road, Kronali, they are clearly text. These are clearly integers, no decimals, and these are clearly floating points or real numbers. So they will be a double. And remember to do this. Um, you can't change it afterwards. So be careful and make sure that you get the attribute right. A final thing I will talk, want to talk about with the data types is the domain. A domain is a subset of a data type. And um, even though I've already said, oh, just use the biggest, we often want to be able to restrict our attributes to specific ranges. So you can't enter uh, 5,000 storages as the height of a building or 7,000 meters or things like that. So we have to consider reducing our inputs to something that is within the legal range or an acceptable range. So a domain is a subset of a data type and there are basically two types of domains. There are range domains, where we have a minimum and a maximum value we can specify, and ArcMap will then check that um, the data is within that range. The other type is coded lists, where we can have a list of legal choices, and we can then even assign small codes to them so that we can efficiently store those codes rather than having the long text. But having a list of choices is a good thing it's for two reasons. First of all, you might have surveyors like me that have problems spelling um, and therefore we might enter a uh, grass field as something that's not spelt in the same way as other people who spell it. Or um, there might be problems of using uh, uppercase and lowercase, is it the same and so on. So having that control and saying, okay, these are the choices you can choose from um, is really important. You can also have a common issue of people going into the field and then inventing their own data types, um, forest with lake underneath or something like that. So. Having code lists ensures um, that everyone using the same classes. And especially on small devices, mobile phones, um, code lists have the advantage that, that applications typically can generate drop down menus. So instead of having to type it, you can choose from that drop down list. So, a final uh, note is that 
if you remember the video on geodata and I talked about ontologies. If your data you're going to create is going to be used by more than one person or if it's going to be used for more than just a moment, it's a really good idea to write down what is all of your, those different types. How do you define a forest? How do you define a dirt track and so on? So um, be cautious if the data set is going to be used for more than just a moment and for more than one person, be explicit about your definitions because we all have ideas in our own heads about what is a forest, but they are not necessarily the same ones. So be explicit and um, your data will hopefully be useful for more than just you. So that was all on the planning part of the creation of geodata.